Hey, 8363MTR, what brings you into town? Well, I had the video that I wanted to cover, and I was wondering if you'd be interested in the co-op. Really? What video do you have in mind? Mr. Enter's video on modern PSAs. He essentially made a review of things like the Stephen Universe PSAs on racism and the Arthur PSA on mask. Yeah, it's like a year old at this point, but I still didn't like the video at all. Wow, neither did I, so let's do this. Also, we're skipping the first five or so minutes because it takes that long for Enter to actually start reviewing a fucking PSA. And I think we need something really simple to get started with. What is the least controversial topic that we can start with today? Global warming. I'm sorry, but who in the ever-living flying fuck is this robot here? Last time I checked, this robot wasn't in any prior answer videos here, so I'm at a complete loss. Okay, well, I'm fucked. It's all downhill from here, kids. Okay, so we're not going to address the robot in the room? Okay, cool. Love the confusion on this. For the record, as a longtime fan of Enter, I know he's done stuff like this before. Some of his older videos had an old man character, for example, who would occasionally guide Enter when he needed it. However, that character first appeared in his In Search of the Titanic, aka Tentacolino, review, and, oh yeah, Enter didn't immediately expect us to know who he was, hence why he was actually given an introduction. Wait. Oh, the 23rd's coming up. I've got one animated atrocity left, and then I could start reviewing episodes of MLP again. And the next one is, oh goody, a sixth episode. That means a G3 special. No, my son. There is one thing you must do before you return to Friendship as Magic. One you have been delaying from the very beginning. Uh, hi. Do I know you? No, you do not. But you know my words. They said that one day, you would be able to fight a sea sponge. After conquering the worst animated movie ever made, you are finally ready. You don't mean... Put it together, boy. We're in Atlantis. You know what comes next. But I do a G3 episode every six reviews. I don't want to break a pattern. Call it episode 31. You must deal with this now. Are you telling me to cheat? Yes. Yes, I am. What kind of ancient master are you? I'm not. I'm a crazy old man who drinks some laundry detergent and broke into your house thinking he's Chop Chop Master Onion. Now tell me, what did the detractors say about Magical Mystery Cure? They said that the musical numbers were terrible, they didn't have a right to surprise us on the musical element, the plot was nonsense, and it was an insult to the adult fan base. Show them what that looks like. Show them the truth. It must be done. His next review was Atlantis Square Pantis, which is actually a really clever use of continuity on Enter's part. However, the thing I want you to notice is the fact that we, the audience, were not supposed to just take the fact that all of a sudden there's an old man character in Enter's reviews now on its own. Enter actually gave the character some sort of introduction. Compare it to this robot character who just appears out of nowhere. This kind of PSA is pretty common, I'd say. As climate change becomes a more more hotly contested political football. We don't get these kind of things as much as we did in the 90s, but every show needs to have an Earth Day special, whether it be Spongebob or The Loud House. So, uh, the greenhouse from The Loud House kind of blows. Okay, so this might be weird for me to interject, but whenever Mr. Enter reviews a new thing, especially considering that it's supposed to be his job, we're going to give out a synopsis for each of the episodes slash PSA Starting off with the greenhouse. During class in the greenhouse, Mrs. Johnson was taking part in an eco-friendly polar bear challenge to find ways to reduce their carbon footprint. But Lincoln's house had a huge footprint due to his multiple sisters. Because of that, Lincoln is doomed to be a social outcast because they're going to lose. In order to solve the issue, Lincoln convinced his sisters to go green by reducing their carbon footprint, such as recycling the baby diapers for electricity, or writing a letter instead of communicating via by electronics. Their house goes green, but it fails because Lincoln's friends came over and participated in an online sorts and cyborgs tournament, one of which is his best friend, Clyde, because he couldn't power on due to his solar house not being able to generate electricity due to the sun being covered up. Their sister saw that Lincoln was a hypocrite and got their stuff back. Lincoln learned that he should have gone green for the sake of it instead of his own selfish desires and decided to power the house manually via a bicycle. They won the polar bear challenge, but Lincoln became a temporary social outcast due to how he stinks. Again, it's going to be weird for us to do this. In fact, you guys might be wondering why we're doing this, but I have two major issues with the Enter's reviewing style as we move along. And part of this is with having us to give out a synopsis to each of the episodes slash PSAs. I don't even know what those reasons are, and I'm his co-op partner, so I'm just as lost as the rest of you. 
like really hard. Actually, that's uh, that's a weird statement. The Greenhouse is a fascinating episode for someone who is not an environmental activist. It's bad, but it's fascinatingly bad because of how incompetent it is. You see, The Greenhouse from The Loud House showcases exactly why every single environmental PSA ever made has been completely useless in doing anything. I'm absolutely serious on this one. You want to know why environmental messages don't work? This is the episode why. You know, I'm starting to think Enter doesn't like the environmental message of this episode. Call it a hunch. I'm sorry, what does Enter not like again? The environmental message. I forgive you for not picking that up, he's being really subtle. Ah. Wait. I forgot again. Okay, so you know how this episode has an environmental message? No, I'm saying that I have a memory of a goldfish. Keep up, please. For starters, you ever watch an environmental PSA that shits on renewable energy? And I mean, the episode has a good point here. It's not up to the kids whether their house is solar powered or powered by fossil fuels. That's their parents doing. Which is kind of a problem for the plot, you know. I mean, even though that isn't what the main message of the episode is about. The main episode's topic is about finding ways to reduce their carbon footprint overall. Y you know. Things such as not using a lot of electricity, such as sending out physical letters, or using recyclable bottles to play instruments on. Also, this is even implying that kids and only kids are just watching this, because not only are people like you and me who are animation fans watching this, to which the both of us are adults, but the kids' parents might also watch this too when it comes to supervising their kids and or if they want to engage in that activity with them. U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics provided an article made by Rachel Grenz Kent called Television, Capturing America's Attention at Prime Time and Beyond, and states that of those who are 15 years and up, who have watched television, 57.2% are with family and 20.2% are with children. Unfortunately, they don't state the definition of family, so while the latter is what they're probably talking about, I've gone with both just to be safe. So really, this isn't geared just towards children in terms of the message of the episode. It's also directed to the parents too. For that matter, Enter says that this episode shows a flaw with renewable energy because Lincoln's parents don't use it. So renewable energy is bad because people don't use renewable energy. How is that a flaw exactly? Lastly, Enter quite literally just said that the main conflict of the episode is a problem with the plot. I don't even know how to respond to that. You ever get an assignment at school where your success or failure depends entirely on other people like your parents and your siblings and the size of your family? It's a challenge, not an assignment. The students won't get a lower grade if they don't succeed. As, as shitty as my school was, I, I don't think I ever had that situation like Lincoln does in this episode. But, I mean it's accurate, because a single person can't really do much for or against the environment. Especially if they're not rich. I love it, really, but yes. In this battle between fossil fuels and renewables, they both have issues and downsides. I don't know why this is contentious, why these are seen as a magic bullet, but both solar and wind power have issues. Neither of them are effective enough to meet current power demands with our current technology. And each of them actually do have environmental issues. Wind power requires clear-cutting forests and chops up birds like nothing else. Ten times as many birds die entangled with electrical cords, then die through being chopped up by wind turbines. To further back up the point, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as of 2017, wind turbines kills off more than 230,000 birds, but yet there are other deadly causes to birds that are considered to be man-made. Things like collisions to both building glasses and vehicles, and birds can also be poisoned from man-made objects, are actually a lot higher than wind turbines. All of these are considered to be in the millions. Not only that, but they've either resolved or greatly reduced the deaths through technology development or by properly siting wind plants. Apparently one of those is just by painting the fins black. And they're planning on developing another technology development with bats. Also, they can be placed on existing farms and ranches where they can greatly benefit the economy in rural areas considering that they only have a small fraction of land mass. Also, there's wind turbines out in the ocean too, even though that they're more expensive to make, so... there's that, I guess? Like, if we're assuming that cutting forests down is true, then that's a big problem, especially when it comes towards places like being on top of a mountain. But there's other areas where wind turbines can be placed that don't have the trees be chopped down. 
Not only that, but if you also consider the ecological damage and pollutants via fossil fuels, whether it be from extracting or burning them, this is admittedly negligible. Solar panels actually produce a ton of waste in and of themselves, and they must be replaced every five years. And we don't have a place to really store retired solar panels. If only we had some kind of plot of land which we could, let me think, fill with trash. Sadly, it seems like the world has yet to come up with this crazy invention. Yes, I know landfills aren't the most environmentally friendly approach, but Enter said we didn't have anywhere to store retired solar panels, which is just wrong. Had he said we didn't have a good place to put retired solar panels, then that would be more accurate. So what Enter is saying here is mostly true. One of the parts that isn't true is that there are indeed some solar panels that do end up being recycled, but it should be noted that only 10% of it is indeed recycled. This is because there's only one state via the state law in Washington that does indeed make people recycle their solar panels as of August of 2020. But other than that, the US has no solar recycling mandates at all. Another part that isn't true is when Enter states that the average lifespan of a solar panel is about 5 years, because the source that I got it from says that it can last for about 25 years. Yeah, funny you mentioned that. When I looked it up, it said it was between 25 and 30 years. Hell, another article I found even says they don't stop producing energy after that point, they simply produce less of it. Yet another source I could find says they could last up to 50. I should note, these were among the first results I got from various Google searches while trying to find where Enter got this idea. So, I am more confused with how and why Enter got that 5 years thing. Wonderful. Anyways, well, although I can make this interjection a lot longer by strengthening Enter's point, because yes, most of this I do agree with Enter here, what I would actually recommend that you guys do is read up a Grist article made by Maddie Stone called Solar Panels Are Starting to Die. What would we do with the megatons of toxic trash? Trust me, it goes into a lot more detail about how solar panels get recycled and why we don't really recycle them to begin with. Which, fun fact, also helps Ephraim's landfill point, as it typically costs less than a dollar to dump a solar panel in a solid waste landfill, rather than a typical e-waste facility, which oftentimes equal the cost to recycle. That being said, however, I really don't like the overall delivery of the point that you've made here. What I'm saying is that you do realize that if there's an issue that needs to be addressed, then you don't throw up your hands and say, I give up, this is not a renewable energy that we should hugely rely on. You actually need to find a solution and produce that solution when you can. You are giving me this huge I give up mentality to the point where I honestly think that if you didn't think like that, then you would have a better understanding about why we need solar energy. I know that it might take a while for us to find a solution, but we don't find a solution if you assume that we can't find one to begin with. Even if it takes us more than 100 years from now, to which I do agree that we should find one now, but bear with me with this exaggeration, us finding one within the future is better than us not doing anything about it at all. But don't you see 8,363? Because the solutions now aren't perfect, we should keep doing things that are even worse. And of course, the most common criticism brought up, which is what the episode goes with, is that sometimes the wind doesn't blow and the sun don't shine. John, if the sun actually stopped shining, you'd fucking die within a couple of days at most, as would all life on Earth. While batteries exist, a constant flow of power is required in a developed nation. Because without the constant flow of electricity, people will die, as would happen during the cold snap that hit Texas last winter. The Texas thing became a flashpoint in the climate change debate, both fossil fuels and windmills froze. And both sides are claiming that the other side is stupid. The actual issue is that Texas failed to winterize. Because, and hear me out on this, when environmentalists claim that the planet is warming at an unprecedented rate due to fossil fuels, the last thing that anyone thinks to do is make sure that windmills in the desert that is Texas, which is a primary exporter of oil, can withstand heavy snowfall. Ah, the well-known scientific fact that snow cannot fall in places where there is oil. What? Okay, to be fair, maybe John just means that blizzards are rare in Texas. And this is true if you ignore the fact that Texas suffered massive blizzards in both 2015 and 2017. 
I also want to point out John's story here, that because environmentalists said the world was going to warm at an unprecedented rate, Republicans in Texas, who deny the claims environmentalists make, therefore decided not to winterize. It doesn't make any sense. Remember, Texas was the state George W. Bush was governor of, and as governor, he caused it to have the worst air quality of any state. A full history of Bush's environmental record as governor of Texas can be found in Molly Ivins and Lou DeBose's book, Shrub, The Short But Happy Political Life of George W. Bush, if you are curious. Texas has been controlled by Republicans almost exclusively since the mid-90s or so, with the <clears throat> election of George W. Bush to the presidency in 2000, turning it into the massive Republican stronghold we know it to be today. One of the Republicans who has ran the state since then has been Rick Perry, who was George W. Bush's lieutenant governor and the governor of Texas from George W. Bush resigning from the office so he could be president in 2000 until Greg Abbott's inauguration in early 2015. Rick Perry is also the man who very famously campaigned on the promise to abolish the Department of Energy when he ran for president in 2012. He also sometimes forgot what the Department of Energy was. And I will tell you, it's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, uh, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> Com five. Oh, five. Yeah, okay. So five. commerce, education, and uh, the um, uh, uh, EPA. EPA. There you go. No, okay. Let, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk deposition. Seriously? Um, is EPA the one you were talking about? Or? No, sir. No, sir. We were talking about the. Um, agencies of government. The EPA needs to be rebuilt. But There's you no can't, doubt about but that. But you can't name the third one? The third agency of government. Yeah. I, would, I would do away with the education, uh, the uh, <laughs> commerce. I, I, commerce, and let's see. I can't. The third one I can't. Sorry. And yes, that is the same Rick Perry who was later Donald Trump's Secretary of Energy. Also, ignoring that Texas has their own power grid and like you're treating the Texas outage affecting the rest of the country, which it didn't, your explanation for why Texas failed to winterize is completely wrong. It has nothing to do with Texas being a desert, which is ludicrous in its own right because the vast majority of Texas is plains near the coast and semi-arid farther out. It's mainly because more than a few Texas politicians have their hands in the fossil fuel industry, and therefore, those are their more primary concerns. Heck, why do you think that in 2019, less than 28% of electricity was made by fossil fuels, where less than one-third of it is made by renewable energy? John is right that Texas is a primary exporter of oil. However, what he fails to realize is that means the oil industry has a lot of money and therefore a lot of influence over Texas politicians. I know this is an old example, but fuck, which state gave us Enron again? And they were able to operate as they did for so long because regulators simply didn't bother looking into them because they were seen as a powerful oil company and therefore were allowed to do basically whatever the hell they wanted. Doesn't help that an ex-mayor of Colorado City, Texas proclaimed on Facebook, This is survival of the fittest. As many people were freezing to death, nor does it help that Ted Cruz, a senator in Texas, decided that a family trip to Cancun was more important than helping the state that he represents, even with the fact that he states that it was a mistake for him to go. Plus, a very good chunk of people in Texas are climate change deniers. Admittedly, not a majority. About 23% of Texans are climate change deniers, but a good chunk of the state are. This also includes some of the politicians in the state. They never even had the foresight to prepare for a situation like the one they had in February of 2021, even though they were all warned 11 years ago as of writing the script that their grid was nowhere near ready for winter storm conditions. This was a prime example of why climate change denial and over-reliance on fossil fuels can have devastating consequences. Climate change, global warming, whatever you want to call it, I do believe is real. The evidence is obvious, but it's obviously a poorly marketed and poorly named problem, and the way we talk about it is completely wrong. Remember, weather is not the climate, but the unprecedented cold weather in Texas is proof of climate change. 
people said that it was a result of climate change, not that it was proof of climate change. You've gotten this point completely backwards. Also, there's that robot again. Uh, hi, uh, are you going to introduce yourself or am I going to be wondering who you are for the rest of the video? Science communication is a field that has been dead for decades at this point. We are in desperate need of a Bill Nye that hasn't gone fucking insane. So, you guys, seriously, this next thing I feel is very special. Cause my sex junk is so oh, 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 much more than either. Oh, oh, oh. This song was nominated for an Emmy, by the way. At this point, I would like to formally nominate Genghis Khan for an Emmy, because he is just about as deserving as an Emmy as anything else the Emmys award and nominate these days. Wait, the song itself? Hold on, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, let me check up on that. Alright, so here's the 2017 Emmys list provided by Deadline. Now, let me find the episode in question... Ah, here we go. Bill and I Saves the World, The Sexual Spectrum. That's the episode title in question, I should add. Now, what are the other nominees? Amanda Knox, Anthony Bourdain Bart's Unknown, The Beatles, Eight Days a Week, The Touring Years, and 13th. Huh. Well, really weird list of nominees, but it's probably for best song in the documentary. Now, what's the category? Outstanding writing for a non-fiction program. Are we not going to include the other parts of the episode, Enter? There are actually more things about the episode than just a cringy bit that everyone seems to focus on. Bill and I talks about the six chromosomes and how one in every 400 pregnancies have a different number of sex chromosomes, use an apicus to describe how sex, gender, attraction, aka sexual orientation, and expression are all in a spectrum, actually talks about South Korea, a place where they're more conservative, and how K-pop is changing the idea of sexual expression, with one example being one artist known as Amber, and how she's expressing more of a tomboy look, and another about how South Korean men are wearing more makeup, had a panel of experts, which involves people like Dr. Jeffrey McCoon, that talks about the history of misconceptions of homosexuality in general, then a small animation of the ice cream bit, then the cringy song, and then finally used four mannequins for an overview on the topic. It was possibly nominated for an Emmy because of the other bits and not just the song itself, so I... China have no idea why you've mentioned the song and how that song itself was nominated for an Emmy. Because if the song itself was nominated for an Emmy, it would have been nominated in a different category such as the Original Music and Lyrics Award. I don't even get what Enter's point is supposed to be. So, science communication is dead because an episode of Bill Nye Saves the World had a silly song? Okay? What is the song communicating exactly, and is it scientifically accurate? Enter goes into literally no detail, instead he just flashes the song on screen like a predator flashes his cock and expects us to get it. Lastly, why would you nominate Genghis Khan for an Emmy? Genghis Khan is a person and may he rest in peace. For the record, I get the joke is supposed to be, lol, that's so bizarre and it would never happen, but it doesn't even make any sense. Wouldn't it be funnier if John said a well-known bad movie was nominated for an Emmy as opposed to an imperialist warlord from the 12th and 13th centuries? So, the greenhouse accurately showcases what's going to happen when any country goes green. Climate change is not an entirely environmental issue. It's a diplomatic one. In the episode, Lincoln makes his house go green. So everyone else in the class trying to stay green takes advantage of Lincoln. If you don't dig for oil in your backyard, you're gonna have to ask your neighbors for some. And you're gonna have to do just about whatever they say, no matter how immoral they are, because the demand for it hasn't vanished. The problem is, with current technology, renewables aren't as reliable as fossil fuels. So when a country does decide to go green, it lowers its own productivity, hurting it on the global stage. Other countries are incentivized not to go green, as it gives them an economic boom and more relative power on the global stage. Eventually, the polluters are going to dominate the global stage, by polluting. Okay, one thing that really annoys me about this video is the fact that Enter constantly refuses to give sources or use examples to back up his point. And this is a great example as to why that is a massive issue. What makes Enter believe this? 
Fuck if I know, but he does. According to John, if China went green but Ethiopia got rid of all its regulations, Ethiopia would become an economic superpower overnight, apparently. It wouldn't be such an issue if there wasn't one obvious counterexample Enter hasn't addressed, albeit he kind of tries to later, and we'll get to that in a minute. And that's the various environmental treaties, such as the Kyoto Protocols or the Paris Climate Accords, which the vast majority of the world has signed on to. There are also the various economic issues such things would cause. For example, limiting the amount of fossil fuel in existence would lower supply and therefore raise prices, making it less affordable for the average person, and therefore incentivizing a shift to renewable energy. Oh please, you say that he doesn't have any sources, but I have a theory that he probably doesn't want us to see it. For those at home, my co-op partner is currently staring at me very menacingly. I'm scared. Please, I ain't going to do anything to you. Yet. I need an adult. But I am an adult. Oh, well, then I need a second adult, I guess. Things like the Paris Accord only work if everybody plays together. In the current state of global affairs, everyone is not going to play together. And yet, nearly every country in the world signed on to it. Also, this idea that the Paris Climate Accords wouldn't work just doesn't make any sense when you actually know what the Paris Climate Accords were. Each country involved with the Climate Accords sets forward their own goal, which they can meet however they want. Many countries just submitted what they were going to do anyway. Hell, a number of countries submitted that they were going to reduce their carbon footprints by less than they were going to do so anyway. Plus, there was no actual penalty for a country not following through with its end of the bargain. So tell me, John, what would the Paris Climate Accords not working look like exactly, and how would it be different from it working? To get more specific, China promised that it would reach peak emissions in 2030, at which point it would start reducing. Which, by the way, was when it was going to hit peak emissions anyway. I guess if enters right and the Paris Climate Accord fails, they'll intentionally wait longer to hit peak emissions. I guess because the world's largest nation and an economic superpower still needs to remain a superpower via polluting. Pakistan promised that it would at some point hit its peak and then start reducing emissions. If ENTER is right and the Paris Climate Accords were a failure, then Pakistan is going to keep increasing its emissions for all of eternity. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the Paris Climate Accords, if you couldn't tell, although that's primarily because I disagree with what they fundamentally are. John was right when he said that climate change is a political issue, and the Paris Climate Accords were a political agreement at the end of the day. As such, if we want to discuss John's statement that the Paris Climate Accords wouldn't work, we need to discuss what they are. If the goal was environmental in nature, then they were a failure. But that's not because the countries didn't play together, that was primarily because it was designed in such a cartoonishly diplomatic way that any chance of actual change was dead on arrival. It's almost like it was made by the Obama administration or something. However, if the end goal was political, I would at least argue the success has been mixed, considering it did put climate change front and center in our political discourse for quite some time afterwards. When conservatives point to China and India, they aren't just whinging. By ignoring their impact, it incentivizes them to keep polluting, making them more powerful, making pollution more powerful. Ignoring them? The Trans-Pacific Partnership was specifically designed to counter China when it came to things like human rights and, yes, the environment and carbon emissions. Don't get me wrong, the Trans-Pacific Partnership had tons of issues and it was an overall good thing the United States didn't ratify it, but that doesn't change the fact that politicians are discussing how to deal with the environmental impact of China. Oh, also, per capita, the United States produces over twice as many carbon emissions as China does, just so you all know. So this episode that says you should go green brings up another really good point against going green. Environmentalism is gross. Like, really gross. If you want an example, the pandemic of 2020 killed a lot of virtues, but I think that environmentalism was one of their first sacrifices. Wear a mask, make sure you don't use the same one twice in a row. Either dispose it, or waste a shit ton of water in between each use if you want to do this properly and safely. I mean, never mind that we also have reusable mask, enter. 
To be fair, he did mention those before dismissing them because washing them uses, quote, a shit ton of water. How much water? I'm not sure, but it's a shit ton. Throughout 2020, 1.5 billion masks have fallen into the ocean, and they tend to end up scattered across the ground as well. The overcleaning and the aerosols involved in sanitizing everything is bound to jack up the ecosystem. I like how we went from one person not being able to have a massive impact on the environment, to you personally wearing a mask and using soap is going to literally end the world. Also, Enter had it right the first time because roughly half of all CO2 emissions come from top corporations and billionaires. In fact, the entire idea of a personal carbon footprint was thought up by BP Oil. Even ignoring 2020 specifically, you shower probably every single day, which is more than you need to. Scientifically speaking, and it wastes water. You also waste clean, fresh water every single time you flush the toilet. Like, every single day, you waste enough water for an entire family to survive on for a week. If climate change scientists and activists are right, flushing the toilet might be the sin that future generations try to erase us for when the water wars start. No, I'm not exaggerating. Remember, those environmentalists are doing nothing but panicking. Also, we're literally going to have wars over water in the future. You know, even though billions of people are water insecure right now, and we don't have the Great World Water Wars trademark, if you can be dismissive, then so can I. But you want to flush the toilet every single time you use it, never reuse dirty clothes, shower every single day, because it's all about feeling good! Dana, did you see some, uh, shirts here in the floor bed area? Yeah, I put them in the hamper. I have a hamper? It's in the bathroom. Will you tell me next time you're gonna do that, though, please? Well, I thought they were dirty. <laughs> I have more than two grades of laundry, okay? There's not just clean and dirty. There are many subtle levels, okay? ONE STRUGGLE! In the episode, Lincoln and the class aren't interested in making an environmental change for the better. They're doing it for the selfish reasons of naming a polar bear. In this environmental episode, everyone only does environmentalism for their own selfish ends. To the point they take advantage of other people so they can claim to be environmentally friendly. This is true, but there's also the fact that Lincoln states near the end that we should be going green for the sake of it instead of our own selfish desires. You know, the actual moral slash lesson that you've decided to not include, and instead talks about how environmentalists are stinky, or how others would take advantage of you. And also, everyone is held up to the same standard, despite vastly different sizes of population. Which, once again, is accurate. Environmental regulations tend to hurt bigger families, which are usually poorer families because rich people tend to have fewer kids for a variety of reasons that I'm not gonna go into right now. I love how he shows a picture of a family from, I'm pretty sure that's India to make his point, even though the average Indian family only admits half a ton of CO2 per year. Hell, despite what Enter would have you believe, the rich are more responsible for CO2 emissions than the poor are. Yes, I know I keep bringing that up, but in my defense, it is a very important point. Even then, the average Indian is still producing less than the global average of 4 tons a year, and especially less than the 16 tons a year the average citizen of the United States produces. In fact, the main reason why India is producing a lot of CO2 emissions, even though the average person only emits just under two parts per million is because the country is one of the most populated countries in the world. Over 1.3 billion as of 2016 as a matter of fact. It is therefore why India is considered to be ranked third in 2016 of the countries who emit the most CO2 emissions. Now, if this is not a family from India and it's instead just the family in some random third world African country that hasn't yet industrialized, then this point still doesn't make any sense. Because while it is true that carbon emissions did spike as the result of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, that doesn't tell the full story. The graph on your screen right now is from Our World in Data, and it tracks carbon emissions ever since 1750. Although there was a spike during both the US and China's industrial eras, it should be noted that the carbon emissions continued to grow after that point for a variety of reasons. In the US, it was primarily due to a hostility towards both renewable energy and nuclear power. Put together with the United States' status as an economic superpower in the post-World War II era, resulting in more growth primarily because it 
existed for longer. The nations of countries like Japan, the United Kingdom, and Germany had to all rebuild after World War II because they were massively damaged. You can't really create factories or have office buildings where people work when every single piece of your infrastructure was bombed by either the Nazis or the Allies. The U.S. was mostly absolved from this, and as such, they were able to essentially just pick up where they left off after the war was over. And this was before anyone had even heard of the concept of a carbon footprint, so nobody even thought that maybe all these fossil fuels were harmful for the environment. By the time we did start learning more, powerful people had a vested interest in us not learning more, and hid both information about this and environmentally friendly alternatives. And in China, it's for a variety of complex reasons, basically coming down to neoliberal economic reform, especially after we started opening up trade with them in the 90s, causing their leading communist party to basically turn the entire country into a brutally efficient perpetual economic growth machine. This combined with the fact that China has the largest population of any country on earth, results in them having the most CO2 emissions. It's not industrialization necessarily, it's how those in power have reacted to it. And poorer families are disproportionately minority families. And yeah, that tends to be how ECHO resolutions go. They treat every single situation exactly the same, even if it's unfeasible for some people to actually meet these resolutions. And they really, really fuck over the working class and the poor which ended up sparking the Yellow Vest protests in France. John, turn your music down! We can't hear you! Well, an interesting fact about it, Enter did state within the description saying, and I quote, audio mixing was done by me, and I know there were issues with it in a couple of places. Huh, I didn't realize that was an excuse. It's like an episode on why environmentalism is a stupid fool's errand. But, I mean, climate change activists themselves have kind of convinced me of that. And what I'm about to say assumes that everything is honest and every single one of these studies is above board, where everything they say is completely 100% honest and truthful. The biggest proponents of climate change are climate change activists. They've basically been arguing unless we radically change how society is structured, we've got 12 years before the end of the world. Taking a step back from the panic, it's 12 years until climate change becomes irreversible or very much damaging. Either way, it doesn't really change how futile everything is. So, they have thoroughly convinced me, personally, that the only thing we could do in our fight against climate change is remove all funding to climate change research, environmental protection, and allocate it to surviving the oncoming changes. Because there's no way you're doing something that basically requires world peace to stop, and fundamentally changing the nature of the human race in a zodiac cycle. Take that, the Clean Air Act of 1970! We cannot fundamentally change human nature in a dozen years! Also, even if what John says is true, wouldn't it make more sense to delay it so we can at least be more prepared when it happens? Up, up, up! That's spoiler territory! He mentions this again later on in the review. You mean there's more of this? Wait. I think we forgot that this is a review. Okay, yeah, I should probably say, Enter loves to go on long-winded tangents throughout the review about something that he wants to rant about politically instead of trying to talk about the episode. I should note, coming from someone who is a political writer and who can ramble about these topics all the time, just look at this commentary if you don't believe me, I'm not against Enter going on these side tangents, assuming he can tie them back to what he's talking about. This is where Enter honestly drops the ball. He goes on and on about things that have basically nothing to do with the episode he's reviewing outside of the fact that they're vaguely related to the topic at hand. This isn't even like what John did in his Let's Not Be Skeletons review where he gave his opinion on gun control so everyone knew his own biases. That would be fine, but instead he's trying to debunk these vague activists and argues things that, best as I can tell, nobody argues against. I should also note that this actually isn't the worst of it, as the worst of it comes in when we talk about COVID-19 and its relations to masks. J just thought that I should prep you guys. John, do you need to start a news podcast or something? I probably would. I would start a podcast about why bisexuals are valid. I did a news podcast before. 
It was okay. I mean, do you want to live in the 2020 lockdowns for the rest of your life? Because some environmental obsessed governments are wanting to replace pandemic lockdowns with environmental lockdowns. Which ones? John, do you think people are taking Soylent Green as a blueprint or something? Because if so, well, Chuchescu was executed by a firing squad, so I don't see that as likely. That's a joke for all my understanders of socialist Romania. Fun fact, I was going to try and look this up until I realized I still have no fucking clue on which countries you're talking about. Or if this is some weird nightmare that you had. In fact, I don't really see this as an actual issue to begin with, truth be told. Like, I'm sorry, but part of me is suspecting that you're kind of blowing this out of proportion unless you can prove to us otherwise. The next thing that he reviews is a song from Little Dicky called Earth. In it, Little Dicky talks about climate change and how we should prevent it because animal life and human life would be disrupted. It was released on April 19th, 2019, just three days before Earth Day, and it charted at 17 in the Billboard Top 100s. The song was also a big collaboration with over 30 artists taking part, including Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, Snoop Dogg, Katy Perry, Ed Sheeran, and many more. It's honestly not really a good song, and that's one thing that I, MTR, and Enter can all agree on. It's time to stop! Wow, funny meme XD, John. You just made the whole squad laugh. When one of the most public figures in the climate change debate is a man whose only talent is pointing out how small his manhood is, can you really be surprised that people don't want to get involved in this? Wait, so Little Penis Man is one of the world's biggest climate change activists? I was not aware of this. Hell, I went to Small Richard's Wikipedia page just to make sure this wasn't me being out of touch, and I found one reference to him being an environmentalist, and it was because of this song. I think if we need any activism, we need to raise awareness of people's dick sizes. Okay, you first. Well, I just walked into that one. I should let my boyfriend know. He'll be ashamed of me for this. Yes, we must stop global warming to save the Bieber baboons because they have huge anuses. If we lost those, it would truly be a tragedy on this planet. You do know that species going extinct is bad, right? Like, that would actually terribly affect the ecosystems of multiple countries. Hell, just limiting this to baboons, they play a very important part in the Finbos ecosystem in South Africa, where they have lived for over two million years, and their extinction would greatly change how the ecosystem functions due to their essential role in plant reproduction and plant dispersal. But don't you know? Enter's main point was that it was way too comedic, meaning that he can't take this seriously. Also, remember, environmentalists do not care about the third world according to Enter. They just want to save a species that is incredibly important to the ecosystem of Africa. A species which Enter is more or less saying he does not care about the extinction of. Maybe people would take these activists like DiCaprio or John Kerry or Thunberg more seriously if they practiced what they preached. You cannot, and I repeat this, you cannot be an environmental activist and travel all around the world in planes and cars and stuff. The action is entirely contradictory with the belief. First off, and this is probably a nitpick, but John Kerry is not an activist, he's a politician. For that matter, Kerry only uses public flights that are going to take off anyway, meaning he's not actually adding any additional carbon to the atmosphere that wasn't going to be put there anyway. Thunberg also does not use private jets. Her most famous speech was the one she gave at the United Nations in New York City in 2019. And she traveled from Sweden to New York on a sailboat. Not on a jet. It's like being a vegetarian butcher, it doesn't make sense. Especially in an age with video communications. It's like saying that you're an animal rights activist while running a dogfighting ring. I like how he felt the need to make basically the same comparison twice in a row. Or saying that you care about people with autism while supporting Autism Speaks. Ahem. 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 
I can kind of guess towards what you're trying to go for here, but the issue is that there might be some nuances about the Autism Speaks one. In fact, there might be some other nuances with the other two examples, but I specifically want to go ahead and talk about the Autism Speaks one. Like, for example, and some clarification here, I don't like Autism Speaks either, and this is coming from someone who's autistic here, but if someone states that they want to help autistic individuals but support Autism Speaks, they probably don't know why Autism Speaks sucks to begin with. Trust me, there are people out there who don't know about the true issues of the organization. It's just that people need to be educated more about why Autism Speaks is a bad organization and why you should switch over to other alternatives, such as the ASAN Foundation. But Mr. 63MTR, if we allow room for nuance, how will we take unfunny pot shots of people we don't like? Mallet. Just... Mallet. Honestly, the biggest problem with the global warming debate is that it attracts people with a god complex. Who else has enough delusions to believe that they can change nature, human or otherwise? Especially through flushing the toilet. Okay, my biggest gripe about this point is that you're saying that people aren't changing nature of all things, when yet there has been evidence time and time again showcasing that we are indeed changing nature. Because we're changing the phenomena of the physical world collectively, including plants, animals, the landscape, and other features and products of the Earth as opposed to humans or human creations. Considering that climate is the weather conditions prevailing in an area in general or over a long period, and weather is the state of the atmosphere at a place and time as regards heat, dryness, sunshine, wind, rain, etc., weather is considered to be a part of nature. If anything, if we're going by your wording here, we're trying to prevent the change of nature over time, not saying that we apparently can change it. In fact, hold on, let me go through the three things that we humans are changing in nature with the help of fossil fuels. With precipitation, a lack of rain and snow over an extended period of time will create droughts, and they'll become longer and more extreme over time, with the southwest like California at a severe risk. That means that there's less water for drinking, watering crops, making electricity at hydroelectric dams, and other uses. Due to that, wildfires are occurring more, as well as being able to start more easily, spread faster, and burn longer. I mean, heck, if you heard about California, they used to have a fire season, but now they don't anymore. Fires are popping up here and there all year now. At the same time, places such as the northeastern states are actually getting more precipitation, and thus in turn will create flooding if the precip gets too heavy. This is because this extra precipitation is actually not spreading easily around the globe, and some places might actually get less precipitation than they used to get, like Hawaii or California, for example. With temperature, we need to discuss carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. To start off, let's take a look at the atmosphere and what it's made of. 78% of it is made of nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and the rest, mostly argon, being the 1%. 1% represent! Part of that 1% is carbon dioxide. Before the Industrial Revolution, the global average of CO2 levels was 280 ppm, or parts per million. However, when fossil fuels such as oil and coal were in place, they slowly rose to today's measurements, being somewhere greater than 415 ppm, which has never crossed that level in a millennia. In fact, it never crossed the level of little over 300 until 1950. The important role that carbon dioxide plays in the atmosphere is that it traps heat, because without it, our planet would actually be cold, and we humans wouldn't live without it. The heat from the sun will travel to the Earth, and it will bounce back out into space. CO2's job is to make sure that the heat inside is trapped in. Think of it as walking into a greenhouse during a summer day and noticing that it's incredibly hot. That's what carbon dioxide is, essentially. The issue, however, is that there's actually more CO2 in the atmosphere now, which in turn traps more heat in the atmosphere. This in turn will melt the ice caps on Earth, making the sea level rise each and every year, thus apparently making Aquaman become the best underwater realtor. By the way, we've known that carbon dioxide affects the climate since a study by Swedish chemist Savit Arhinis that was released in 1895. Just a little fun fact for you all. As for winds, a paper published by Jordan Abel and Gresla Winkler on January the 6th, 2021, 
from Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory found a new way of tracking wind patterns. By looking at the sediments that were drilled at the bottom of the ocean, dust and cores collected by the research vessel helped them reconstruct wind patterns that occurred 3 to 5 million years ago. What they found was that the rest of these are actually moving poleward. Though they don't know why this is the case, though this might be due to a shift between certain natural climate cycles, nor whether or not it will confirm if it will rain more or less, it does confirm that the wind and precipitation patterns will change with climate change. If you still don't believe that we're changing nature due to this, then I'm sorry, but I'm honestly at a loss for words. Speaking of complexes, anything else you got to say, little dicky? I, I don't... Excuse me, what? We forgive you, Germany. Yeah, yeah, Germany. I, I, I know you had the whole Nazi thing, but but we're cool now, so, so let's save the planet. Okay, am I the only one who finds it odd that Enter focuses on the line about Germany? Which, by the way, forgiving them implies that they acknowledge the bad actions Germany has done in the past, but doesn't say anything about them saying they love China and India, both of whom are committing genocide right now? What the fuck? What the fuck even is this? Yeah. I don't give a shit what the message is, I'm not gonna listen to anyone who drops a line like that. I especially since Germany hasn't exactly been the best in the fight against climate change themselves. Following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, Germany started reducing its nuclear power plants and opening up more wind farms. These wind farms couldn't meet energy demand and they had to start burning more fossil fuels, raising the country's carbon footprint. Because nuclear energy is literally the only way we will ever face out fossil fuels, and environmentalists need to stop protesting it if they don't want to be hypocrites. Yes, nuclear energy has problems. It's either fossil fuels or nuclear, your choice. Oh, that's lovely. I love the smell of false dichotomy in the morning. If there's one major problem with your point here, it's the overall fact that you think that just because wind and solar energies are not the best solution, that we shouldn't use it, or at the very least that we shouldn't fully replace them to the fullest capacity. You have to understand that we need wind and solar on top of other renewable energies in order to slowly face out fossil fuels. The two other renewable energies that you've completely forgot to mention is with both geothermal and hydropower. If all of these five are combined, if you want to include nuclear into the mix, then it'll help out with replacing fossil fuels altogether. Your argument here is implying that we, those who think climate change is real and that we need to use renewable energy, should replace fossil fuels with only wind and solar when you're missing the big picture here. This is probably why Germany's wind power only didn't work, because they only focus on one thing when they should have tried to invest in other renewable energies too. And yes, there are negatives about all of these renewable energies, whether it disrupts the ecosystem slash environment, the amount of power it produces, etc. But you have to understand that all of the renewable energies positives outrate the negatives, especially when comparing this to the negatives towards fossil fuels. Honestly, I could go on and on about this subject, but after watching this commentary, I would recommend that you guys check out Quartz Get Sacked in a nutshells how many people did nuclear energy kill, nuclear death toll, and Simon Clark's video on how to beat climate change. Because it further helps my overall point about how to beat climate change, as well as to further my point on the death toll on fossil fuels compared to nuclear and other renewable resources. Anyway, we've been covering this video for almost an hour, and we're about a quarter of the way through, slightly more than a quarter, I'd say. Um, so what I'm going to do is, for the first time, I'm cutting this commentary into multiple parts. Not just because, at our current rate, it's going to take about three hours to cover the entire video, but because we have a lot more to say, since... The video only gets worse as it continues. But until then, good night and good luck.